In this video, I'm going to introduce for loops. All the code that I'm going to show you is going to work perfectly in Octave the same way as shown here in MATLAB with one tiny, tiny exception. It's the table function as usual, but I'll note that when I get to it. I'm in the document part 070 underscore loops in the part 08 repetition folder. All of this code, all these documents can be found through links in the video description. This document, part 70, loops, is going to be split into a few videos, but for this first one, we're just going to be talking about loops. So loops are another type of control structure in the same way that if, else if, else, and switches are control structures. Control structures are an aspect of code that control what other code executes, or in our case here, how many times some code is repeated. Now I'm going to first show you some code that runs without a loop and has a lot of repetition. So I'm going to run this section here, control enter, and I print out uh, just a bunch of different numbers and then I print that I'm finished. And I'm setting this LCV variable equal to a variety of different numbers, 1, 3, 7, 7, 5, whatever, whatever, whatever. But then this line of code is just repeated every single time. Uh, exactly. I just copied and pasted it. So that's, that's not necessary. That's redundant. We would like to avoid stuff like that in the future. So here's that same code, but instead with a for loop. And it only takes four lines. Let's go ahead and run it. You can't even tell that I just reran it other than my highlighting went away. Okay, so what did we do here? Well, we use the keyword for, and then we set a variable equal to a vector or a matrix, but mostly a vector. I put all the numbers that I wanted to print out in order in that vector. And then inside of the loop, I display out LCV. My variable name was carefully chosen. LCV stands for loop control variable. It's the variable that controls how many times the loop repeats. Now, a very special thing is happening on this line of code. This is very different from setting LCV equal to a vector. That's not really what's happening here. When I set a variable equal to a vector on the line that contains the word for, what's happening is the code inside of the for loop, the indented code after the line with the for and before the end, is going to repeat once for each value in the vector, starting with the first value. This code is identical to the code above. The first time this line of code runs, LCV equals 1. The second time this line of code runs, LCV equals 3. The third time, LCV equals 7. The fourth time, LCV equals, well, 7 again. And then 5, and then 3, and then 8, and then 2, and then it stops repeating, and we run display finished. Let's move down to another example. So in this example, I'm going to display out powers of 5. 5 to the 1st, 5 squared, 5 cubed, 5 to the 4th, and 5 to the 5th. MATLAB is changing the indentation here. When it gets to 4 digits, it just decides that it wants more indentation. I don't like that feature, but that's what it does. And then I run some code after the loop down here. So in this example, I create the vector that I'm going to loop on before the 4 line. And then I set a variable, in this case k, could be any variable, equal to vector. k is taking the place of my LCV variable. And in MATLAB, the convention is often to use k just as our loop control variable, just to use a short variable name that hopefully isn't being used for anything else. In most other programming languages, we would use i. The reason that i is not being used here is because in MATLAB, i is reserved for the imaginary number. So k is just the default that they decided on instead. So for k equals vector, that guarantees that this code right here is going to run five separate times. Once when k is 1, next time when k is 2, again when k is 3, again when k is 4, and then finally when k is 5. Also a notable difference between MATLAB and other programming languages is once the for loop is finished, we've reached the end, the variable k that we defined on this line with the for right here is still available. It's still in scope, as is or as are any variables that we've declared inside of the for loop, such as a right here. In most other languages, these would not be accessible. It would be an error to try and display these out because they would literally be removed from memory once the for loop ended. For whatever reason, that does not happen in MATLAB. The variables are still in scope. Continuing on down. So here is another example of a bunch of code that is not in a loop for comparison to later on when we show it with a looped code. Again, I'm looking at powers of five, but this time I am building up a vector of those values. I say a, my new vector name, at position 1 equals 5 to the first power. Okay, and there it is right there when I display it out. 
I am displaying it with a table because otherwise it wraps around the screen in a way that I don't like. So for example, if I just remove table right here and then rerun it, like it shows up like this, which I find obnoxious. So to avoid that, I just put table around what I'm displaying. Now table is the one thing in this section in this video that does not work in Octave. So maybe there's some nice alternative. If you know of it, put it in the comments. I'd love to see it. But for now, um, you would just have to delete the word table from this code to run it in Octave. Otherwise, the entire rest of the video's code uh, works perfectly. All right, so we're building up this vector A one element at a time. Into position one, we put five to the first. Into position two, we put five to the second. Into the position three, we put five to the third, and so on. And the array gradually grows bigger, or the vector grows bigger. Now we're going to do that same thing, but with a loop. So here's my for loop. I'm going to loop from one to five, and I'm going to put into A at position k, 5 to the k power. I'm using k both as an index and as a part of a calculation. That's a perfectly fine thing to do because it is just a number. Indexes are just numbers. I'm going to display it out, and I'm literally going to get the exact same thing. You won't hardly even notice a difference other than my highlighting will be replaced. It's the exact same values as before. Now, I hate to say this because it kind of makes people zone out a little bit and tune out when I'm lecturing, but it's the truth. Unless you are practicing loops, you should write code such as this vectorized. And by that, I mean without a loop, by using the built-in MATLAB functionality to operate on vectors. Here are two lines of code that do everything the previous lines of code did, that do everything that the loop does in about four lines of code this does in two, and it would be trivial to do this in one line of code. Let me run it again. And there I get the exact same output as was produced by my loop, because I'm raising five to the power of each and every value in the vector by using the dot operator, dot caret here, raised to the power of each value in the vector, and I receive as a result a vector which I have named A. So when possible, Avoid using loops, because it's usually inefficient, but we still need to learn how to use them for a variety of purposes. One reason is that you can't do everything vectorized. You do need loops in some certain cases. And also, it's just a useful thing to learn because it's a staple of most programming languages. All right, continuing on down here. So here's another example of putting a bunch of powers of five into a vector named A, but there's a little tiny difference here that is actually quite important, and I will talk about more in a later video, but I want to mention now as well. The one difference is this line right here. And it might not seem very important. Why would it matter to create a vector a and fill it with zeros if we're just going to replace all those zeros with powers of 5 anyway? And the reason is this thing called pre-allocation. We want to pre-allocate our vector for efficiency purposes. Now, what you'll see in the later video is that I run some timing code, and this is actually much more efficient than not doing it this way, than doing it with a for loop that doesn't have this line of code here. Let me run this section. All right, great. It shows the same results as before, except A is filled with zeros until they're replaced by powers of five. But if I just get rid of this line and run this section again, it still works great, and it ultimately produces the same output. So why should we care? We should care because what is very much happening behind the scenes when we do not pre-allocate, when we just create A one piece at a time is, your computer will go and look for some memory big enough to fit the 5. And it will reserve that memory, put the 5 in, and return an address to that memory, which you can reference through A. Seems great. However, then when you add the next value, the 25, to this vector, there is no way to guarantee that the memory adjacent to the 5 is empty and large enough to fit this number. So your computer will look through its memory, find a space big enough to fit the two numbers, reserve that space, copy the 5 over into it, and then put in the 25 next to it, and return that address, and that will be the new address where the vector a is located. But then you add a third value. Okay, so it repeats the whole process. Look for some memory that fits three numbers, reserve that memory, copy over the two previous numbers, put the third number in. Oh my goodness, what a hassle. It is very much like I'm building a bookshelf, but I build this tiny little rectangular bookshelf that's big enough for the one book that I own. But then I buy a second book. Okay, well, I pull the nails out, and I get a larger piece of wood, and I build 
another bookshelf that's barely big enough for the two books that I now own. Well, what happens when I have to buy a third book? This is dumb. The better way to do it is to get yourself a big old bookshelf that will fit all the books that you need, or foresee to need in the future, and then just fill in those values when you have them. That's what pre-allocation is, and it is actually much more efficient than not pre-allocating. So that's just a little insight into what happens behind the scenes in the memory. It's not going to affect the for loops directly, other than how long it takes them to run, and for little tiny programs like this, you're not going to notice the difference. Continuing on down. All right, so this is a very common technique to loop through a vector when you need to know the position or index as well as the value. Now, what we did before that was similar to this is I literally just had for LCV equals and then the vector. And if you're just displaying out or calculating based on these values, that's totally fine. But if you also need to know the position at which those values occur, doing it this way is much better. So we don't set for LCV equal to this vector or to values, but for an interval, one through the length of values. So there's, I don't know, eight or nine values here. So LCV is going to be set equal to one through the length of values. LCV is first going to be one, and then two, and then three, and then four, all the way up through however many numbers there are here. And we can still get access to these values with indexing values parentheses LCV. Let me actually run it here. All right, so on the left side, we display the values of the vector, and then on the right side, we display the position at which they occur. Now this is pretty boring, but we'll see some more sophisticated examples momentarily. All right, so here's a more complicated example that's still in the style of the previous example. I'm gonna run it here. What we're trying to do is we're trying to identify the values from this scores vector that are greater than 90, how many of them there are, and where do they occur? Since we need to know those where's, those positions, those indexes, I'm gonna set up my for loop like this, for k equals one to the length of scores. I also need a whole separate variable count to remember how many of these values I've identified. Then inside of the loop, I have an if statement. This is a very common and normal thing to do. We can nest control structures inside of other control structures. If the score at position k is greater than 90, increase count by one, display out the index where it's located, and then once we're done with that loop, display the total count that we determined, and the result is right here. So we found scores at positions 3, 4, and 7 that are greater than 90, and three total values were identified. Continuing on down. Now, that code right there, though, the whole for loop and the if statement, we could just do it on this line of code right here. Or, even simpler, this one right here. So in this one, we get the length of the number of indexes where the score is greater than 90, and in this one, we just add up all the true-false values where the scores are greater than 90. It's just going to be ones and zeros. Might as well just sum up all the ones. And so if I run this code here, I get the same results as that big old for loop. But you still need to be able to write the for loop, write the if statement. That's why we're going over this material. Continuing on down. So earlier we saw an example where we built up a vector named a one piece at a time. I'm going to do the same thing. There's no particular reason I'm using the variable named a, but I am. All right, and see it displays out kind of poorly, so let me try that one more time. All right, it still doesn't display great. But we're putting powers of two in our vector. One step at a time. Put the two in, put the four in after the two, put the eight in after the two and four, and so on down. And then I display it all out at the end, and there's my powers of two. And the way I did this is I set a variable. I named it index this time. I'm just showing you that you can use different variable names. So for index equals 1 through 10, a at position index equals 2 to the index power. It's very similar to the previous example that I did. But this code right here is the same as if I did it all separately like this. Now, obviously, that's like the worst way to do it. Or you can just vectorize it. You can do it all in one step. And so I run this code. And you see I get the same results as before. Or, if even shorter, if you really want, and you don't need that at all, and there it is. I think that's a little bit harder to read than just using another variable name, but uh, you, know, you can do it to your taste. All right, continuing on down. The following for loop is going to determine how many values from this vector meet a particular criterion. In this case, the criterion is totally made up. It's that the value is greater than the average of that same vector plus 20. I just made up this example. 
This is similar to things we've already seen, but I'm trying to reinforce with repetition. So here's my vector. I get the average. I need a variable to store the count. I'm going to loop through the positions in that vector. So one through the length of the vector. And then if the value in the vector at that particular position is greater than the average plus 20, then increase the count. There is an easier way to do this. The easier way is to not loop like this, but to just set some variable equal to v, and then just if k, because we're not actually using the indexes or positions. You should probably know how to do it either which way, and so that's why I'm doing it in a little bit of a clumsy fashion. But anyway, this works. Let's run it. Great, there are my results. There's three of them. And the other way that I had before also works totally fine. And there you go. You can't even tell I reran it. Continuing on down. Now, here's a for loop for separating out values that match a criterion and adding them to a new vector. Now, here's a similar example, but with a twist. I want to copy out the values that match the criterion and put them in a new vector. So you'll see when I run this section that I not only count up that I have three values, but I actually get those values and put them in a new variable. So let's see how I did it. The code is basically the same other than the addition of these two lines right here. So I have a new variable named which above, and at position count, I'm putting the value from my v vector at position index into that vector at that position. So I'm growing the vector one piece at a time. It would be more optimal to pre-allocate the which above, but I don't know how many values are going to meet the criterion ahead of time without doing another calculation. So I can't really do that. I mean, obviously I could just do all this code without for loops, but the whole point is to demonstrate for loops. Now, one important aspect of this is how do you know which variables to use as indexes? How did I know to use count instead of index right here? And what happens maybe? I mean, maybe one way to answer that is just to put an index and see what happens instead of count right there. Let's run it and see. Okay, well, it looks weird, but that's partly because my screen's not wide enough. But also it just put a bunch of zeros into my vector. Why is it doing that? Well, because the 74 is at position 2 in vector v. I want the 74 to be at position 1, though, in my new vector. Right? It's like if I had some totally new vector just named vector, and I set its second position equal to 74, that's fine, but MATLAB puts a 0 at the beginning, which is not maybe what I want. So the way I solve this is I'm going to make use of that count variable. Count is going to go up to 1, and then 2, and then 3, and then so on. And those are the positions where I would like my new values to occur. So I can just use count right here, and then it'll work much more nicely. All right, and there it is. Because I'm putting the second value from v into the first position in which above. And then, you know, I loop around and I get to the, I don't know, 92 over here. And that's the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. The sixth value in v is going to be put at the second position in which above. This is definitely an example that if it confuses you or if other similar examples confuse you, um, breakpoints can be really useful for this. So I might set a breakpoint like right here and then run and advance. And so I've run my code up to this point, but no further. And then I can click step to run through one step at a time. And I can keep an eye on the workspace and see how my values such as count and index are changing as I run through the code. So I click step again. All right, now since this condition was true, we're finally gonna execute the code in here. You might've seen when I clicked step before, it skipped the if. Okay, so I click step, click step, which above was just created as a 74 right there. All right, step, display it out, loop back up to the top, run the if again. Now it's gonna skip everything because the condition is now false with the new value of index. Great, so it skips to the end. And you can keep clicking step to see how things run. I'm going to click stop though and be done with that example and get rid of my breakpoint here. Continuing on down. Now, here's the way to do all of what I just did without any loops at all. And I'm just going to say put into this new variable named which above the values from v where v is greater than the average plus 20. All right, and there are my two results there, same as before. Alternatively, we can get the indexes where v is greater than the average plus 20, and then say put into which above the values from v at those indexes. All right, continuing on down. Here's a pretty basic for loop, but a common thing that you might want to do with a for loop is sum up or total the values of a vector. 
So I got my vector right here. I got an extra variable to determine the total, to store the information that I've added so far. And I loop for value equals values. Note that those are two different variable names. Total equals total plus value. So total equals its previous value, initially zero, plus whatever value I'm adding in. I like this convention for naming your variables where the vector is like plural because it's more than one thing. And then the for loop variable, the loop control variable, is simply the singular of that vector name. Now, of course, there's way easier ways to do this. I just wanted to talk about the variable names there and show how you would do a for loop to total some values up. And the easier way is to just run sum of values right here. But I want to emphasize that in a lot of other programming languages, you would have to write out something like this if you wanted to sum up values in an array that you had. Now, I mean, probably other programming languages also have a sum function, but MATLAB provides you with so many functions that operate so nicely on vectors and matrices, it can be a bit of a shock when you go to a language that's not designed from the ground up for that purpose. You gotta write a lot more for loops for yourself in those other languages. Continuing on down here. Now, what happens when we loop over a matrix? Maybe take a guess before I run this code and see if you're correct. I'm gonna go ahead and run it here. Three, two, one, control enter three groups of items printed out here. This is the first, this is the second, this is the third. I have a matrix right here, two rows, three columns. I set my LCV variable equal to the matrix, and then I displayed it out, and then I displayed a gap, a blank space. So what happened was, this code repeated three times, once for each column of the matrix M. That is simply how MATLAB treats looping over matrices. Each column is treated as a separate item and the loop will repeat as many times as there are columns in the matrix. And if you think about it, this is actually how it's working with vectors as well. If I do a for loop for LCV equals 1 colon 10, that is a matrix with one row and 10 columns. The vector is going to repeat once for each column 10 times. Continuing on down, you can nest for loops inside of other for loops, the same way that you could nest an if statement inside, or an if statement on the outside with a for loop on the inside. So let me run this code first, and then I'll talk through it. And this is just a demonstration of how loops work more than anything else. It's not really accomplishing anything. I've got the same matrix as before. I set a variable named column equal to m. I thought that was a good variable name to emphasize that this variable is going to first be the first column of m, and then the rest of the code will run. And then the loop goes around again, and column has the value 2, 5 as a vertical vector. And then this code runs again, and so on. Now inside of this loop, we're going to display before the inner loop. So that's just like organizing our output here. And then for LCV equals the transpose of the column. Because if I didn't transpose it, then this code would run once, but the loop wouldn't repeat beyond that, because there would just be one column as input. So by transposing it, I make it a row vector, horizontal. And again, if you're ever confused about like what's going on here, you can use those breakpoints to interrupt it and check out what's going on in the workspace as the code runs line by line. Continuing on down here, let me run this code and then we'll talk it through. All right, this loop repeats six times because when I transpose M vertically oriented, I get it horizontally oriented and there will be six total values. Again, you can sort of break this down in pieces. Like if I just copy this into my command window and run it, I see, ah, look, there is a one column six row vector. And then if I transpose that, well, then I have a, a one row six column vector. All right, so all this is just emphasizing that the way for loops work is you set some variable equal to some vector or matrix, and your loop will repeat once for each column in whatever your loop control variable is set equal to. Continuing on down. No, actually, this is where we will pick up the next video. We will talk about another type of loop, the while loop, in the very next video.